Bom dia, boa tarde, boa noite, or whatever the case may be. My name is Marcus, and I am the host of the Black Brazil Today YouTube channel, as well as the BlackBrazilToday.com blog, where I analyze Brazil from the perspective of race. So tonight I wanted to talk about another one of my favorite topics when it has to do with uh, all things Brazilian, I'll say, and that is the music. You can't really, you know, enjoy Brazil and really get to know the country without diving into the music. Now, you know, I remember, I don't know where I read this. It might have been on NPR. I can't remember exactly where I read it, but it was an article that said one time, you know, Brazil. I don't know, it was something like Brazil has the right to make terrible music also. Something like that. And the point is. No matter what country you're dealing with, it, when you get into a culture and a country's music, you're going to come across music that you like and then come across music that you don't like. So that definitely applies to Brazil, just like it, it can apply to the United States as well. I'm, you know, I am an American, but that's not to say I like every style of American music. It's the same with Brazil. But one of my first exposures to Brazilian music was this style I came to know that was called Bossa Nova. Um, love Bossa Nova. Um, if, if you listen to it, you hear some complexities. It, it makes you just wonder like, wow, well, what am I hearing? You know, you hear slight jazz influences in, in there, you know, some, some, some classical touches of classical in there. And, you know, later on, I would come to find out that, you know, Bossa Nova is a type of samba also, which is Brazil's national music. So as I got to know a little bit more and wanted to hear a little bit more, you know, I started doing some crate digging and I came across some gems. And I'm like, wow, this is an, an incredible musical genre. Let me find out more. So it, it's funny because this is not, when I talk about Brazilian music, it's not something that you, I necessarily have to delve into the race issue with it. But then when you deal with Brazilian music, the, the, the race issue comes up anyway. And, you know, that's something I'm going to be exploring in future videos. You know, it's, it's unavoidable, you know, as race played a role in American music, it also played a role in Brazilian music. You know, you have stereotypes about what group should be return, you know, recording what type of music. Um, the access certain people have to, you know, why pop market audiences and others that don't. And you have to ask how these things happen. So as I started digging into Bossa Nova, when I first started listening to Brazilian music, I definitely discovered, I, you know, I found some things that I had questions about. You know, I looked into Bossa Nova and even though I love the music, I was like, well, how come I'm not seeing very many black, very many, very many black Brazilian artists in this genre? And, you know, I'll say, I'll say it again, you know, I don't, as much as I've seen that how the history of race has influenced both the United States and Brazil, I didn't want to just jump to any conclusions about why this seemed to be the case. But, you know, even not necessarily looking to come to that conclusion, I found bits and pieces here and there that says, well, the answer to your question is like looking you right in the face. And it's like, OK, let's just be real about it. We don't have to ignore it, you know, and more and more Brazilians are willing to explore this question these days. So um, definitely, you know, it's worth some research. So today um, I'm going to revisit a piece that I put up in 2021. Uh, it's called Bossa Nova and White Fear, Subtle Mechanisms of Racism Erased Johnny Alf as the father of one of the most important musical movements in Brazil. Now, Bossa Nova at one time, we would say late 50s, early 60s, it was somewhat of a, or, you know, it came across as somewhat of a competition tour to, to America's rock and roll. Now, this is not to say Bossa Nova. Bossa Nova obviously does not sound like rock and roll. I'm not saying that. But in terms of producing a sound that would catch on around the world, Bossa Nova was huge for the, you know, for the, uh, the, the, the period in which it, it came out, you know, and then you had a lot of American artists starting to cover the music, starting to make their own bossa nova. And, you know, it just caught on. 
So similar to the history of rock and roll, blues and jazz, you know, Bossa Nova has its own history. And even though it's not as pronounced the issue of race as it is and what we know about rock and roll and the blues, it's still there. So when I, when I learned who this guy Johnny Alf was, I'm like, wow, this is somebody that I have to talk about. So I'm not even going to take much more time. I just want to get straight into this article. Uh, check it out. There are a number of questions about Johnny Alf. Um, I'm not going to say I have all the answers, but there's several people who have written and talked about Johnny Alf just, in, you know, say in the last 10 to 15 years, just intriguing stuff. You know, it's enough out there where you come to your own conclusion about why it is that it doesn't seem like Johnny Alf was, you know, a well-known artist that came out of that bossa nova well he's actually pre-bossa nova if you want to you know speak more accurately so <clears throat> let me get into this piece and at the end you definitely let me know what uh what you think of it uh, let me i want to ask uh if you watched this video or any others in the past please do subscribe to the channel um consider sharing the material the material i want to Know what your thoughts on on what your thoughts are on the videos that I put up, and uh, you know, click on that notification bell so that you know you'll be notified when I put up new videos. <clears throat> so, with that said, let's get into this uh, this story about Johnny Alf. This is the piano player himself. Um, have to remember what his name is. It isn't actually Johnny Alf. It you know, a lot of Latino and uh, just artists from the Latin American region, they would often like try to, how can we say, anglicize their names in order to possibly reach that American market. I forget what this guy's name is. I'm gonna have to look it up again, but his his real name wasn't Johnny Alf. This was like his stage name. Maybe it's in this piece, but uh, let's go ahead and get right into it. So it's hard to really say what my true introduction to Brazilian music was. Maybe it was the 1964 Miles Davis album, Quiet Nights, or perhaps the George Shearing version of Girl from Ipanema. Maybe it was the Far Side song, Running, that was based on a sample of the Stan Getz, Luis Bonfa song, Saudade Vem Correndo. <clears throat> if I really want to go back, I could also claim that it was one of the songs of the background music to that outrageously campy TV show, Batman, back in the 1960s, that I used to watch as a child. In some of the scenes from that series, I remember a really cool, sophisticated type groove that I always liked. In 1989, with the release of the first in the classic Batman film series, that old Batman TV series started being rerun again on television and everything associated with Batman was being re re reissued to cash in on the Cape Crusader craze. I happened to find a cassette of the music composed by Nelson Riddle for the TV series. And finally, I was able to get that cool song in a version I could listen to whenever I wanted to. They called the song Holy Hole in the Donut. And it featured the Robin character of the TV series saying some of his most ridiculous holy this, holy that exclamations. Oh, well, the song was still cool. I would later learn that the feel of the song was influenced by Bossa Nova, a, a Brazilian invention that mixed samba with jazz with slight touches of classical music for a sound that took the world by storm in the early 1960s. As I usually do when I get into a certain genre of music, I immediately started to expose myself to artists from that style. When I plunged into the Brazilian thing in the year 2000, I started crate digging in some of the great record stores in the suburban Detroit area. What I found was that in terms of Brazilian music, there were really only a handful of Brazilian artists that were available in music stores that sold CDs and vinyl albums. Of course, we don't have as many uh, you know, record stores as we used to have and definitely much fewer uh, record stores that sell vinyl anymore. So like many Americans who started to explore Brazilian music, some of the first artists I learned about were, were, were musicians from the bossa nova genre or MPB, or which is uh, translated as Brazilian popular music. Artists who managed to reach an international audience. This is a cover from the uh, popular 1967 album Wave by Antonio Carlos Jobim. Some of those artists included early stars of bossa nova, such as Antonio Carlos Tom Jobim, João Gilberto, and uh, Luis Bonfá, 
You know, the, the funny thing about uh, Antonio Carlos Jobim is that when I first started checking him out and trying to find more of his music, somewhere along the way, I started finding articles about a guy named Tom Jobim, or, you know, how Americans would say Tom Jobim. And I'm like, wow, I didn't know Antonio Carlos had a brother named Tom. <laughs> I think, um, I don't know when it was I discovered, like, well, in Portuguese, Brazilians, when there's a guy named Antonio, they'll just call him Tom for short. So how Americans would say T-O-M and pronounce it as Tom, Brazilians would pronounce it as Tom, like Tom Jobim. So it was the same guy. It was just kind of funny how I realized that. In my father's old jazz album collection, there was a copy of the 1967 album Wave. Again, that's the, the cover right there. Um, in the stores, there was, a, there was a select group of MPB artists such as Caetano Veloso, Gilberto Gil, Us Mutantes, Gal Costa, who recently passed away, uh, Caetano Veloso's sister, uh, Maria Betania, Tom Zé, and the Brazilian Tropicalia musical movement as a whole. Then there were those compilation CDs that offered an exposure to more artists, some whose individual albums were more accessible, uh, along with others who weren't, such as Ivan Lins, uh, Edu Lobo, and even Carli Carlinhos Brown. So these are some of the artists from the Tropicalia movement. Uh, if anybody gets into Brazilian music, it, you're gonna, it's almost impossible not to, you know, delve into the history of Brazilian music without being exposed to the Tropicalia movement, right? So it's funny, I actually knew Yvonne Lins without even knowing I knew him. Again, in my parents' music collection, I remember seeing the B-side of the 1980 George Benson 45 of the hit single, Give Me the Night, being a song called Dinora Dinora, written by Yvonne Lins. So as it was between the 70s and the 90s, the Batman tape, the Miles album, the Far Side and George Benson, I knew a little, about, a little bit about Brazilian music without even having fully explored it. After catching the Brazil bug at the end of 1999 with the arrival of the year 2000, I started buying Brazilian music. On one of those cheap compilation CDs put out by an unknown record label, I heard the João Gilberto classic track, Coco Vado, and was immediately enchanted with the sound. The acoustic guitar chords, the string arrangements, Gilberto's subtle, almost whisper-like vocals. Hearing that smooth song led to not only wanting to know more about that sound, but also wanted to know what he, what he was singing about. So I knew I would eventually have to learn some Portuguese. At that time, the internet was just beginning to take off, which was perfect timing for me because um, I found an endless source of information about this Brazilian sound that I wanted to know more about. In those first few years of the 2000s, I snapped up LPs and CDs by the aforementioned Jobim, Gilberto, Bonfa, including his collaboration with jazz, American jazz saxophonist Stan Getz, which included the song Saudade Van Cohendo, which was sampled by the West Coast uh, hip hop group known as The Far Side in 1995. I think this was, this was like the first single off of their second album, Lab Cab in California. You know, I actually prefer that album more than uh, their first uh, album. Uh, just just a, a quick side note, this was the first time I was exposed to the production and beat making of a popular Detroit producer named uh, Jay Dilla. Jay Dilla passed away some years ago, but you hear what he did with running. That was an amazing sample there. And at the time, I didn't even consider who was the artist that he had sampled. And that's, I'm listening to Bossa Nova through, you know, filter through hip hop. So by 2004, I had discovered a great record store in Chicago called Dusty Groove that sold music via online orders. Dusty Groove had, had an enormous collection of jazz, classic soul, and so-called world music. Through Dusty Groove, I was able to explore Brazilian music as much as I wanted. I bought all sorts of Brazilian music genres, classic samba, MPB, Brazilian rock and soul, and of course, bossa nova. As my mailman would deliver CDs from Dusty Groove at least once a week, I soon started to notice something about the Bossa Nova CDs and artists. So this is a video you can find on YouTube, Hapaz G. Bain, the song by uh, Johnny Alf. Although I was happy to discover classic Bossa sounds of artists such as uh, Roberto Menescal, uh, Carlos Lida, Ronaldo uh, Boscoli, uh, Oscar Castro Neves, 
Milton Banana, Sergio Mendes, João Donato, and groups such as Bossa 3, MPB 4, Bossa Rio, Copa 5, Tamba Trio, and San Balanza Trio. I started to notice that it seemed that hardly any Black artist, it seemed that there were very few Black artists that recorded in the Bossa Nova style. There were artists such as singers uh, Elisetti Cardozo and Alaigi Costa, along with guitarist Baden Powell and drummer uh, Wilson, Do, Wilson Das Neves. But for the most part, the most well-known well singers, musicians, and composers were generally white. Hmm. Wonder why that was. As the Dusty Groove site always included great notes and descriptions about the albums and CDs that they sold, that was how I came across the music of the piano player, Johnny Alf. Alf's sound clearly fit into the bossa nova style. The soft vocals, light percussion, horn and string arrangements were all there. Plus Alf played piano, an instrument that was notab noticeably absent in the music of most Brazilian artists or most black Brazilian artists. I would later come to discover that having a piano on one's album gave a Brazilian artist repertoire a type of sophistication that separated him or her from the Brazilian, from other Brazilian music, particularly samba, which is the genre where most Black Brazilian musicians were to be found. This was something that I came across in this book that I um, I discussed this on a video that I did about uh, Whitney Houston. I think it uh, yesterday makes uh, what is it the eleventh or twelfth year anniversary of Whitney Houston passing away. But I, in that video, I talked about how it, it doesn't seem likely that a clearly Black woman in Brazil can make it to becoming a top-notch and top-notch uh, talent, a top-notch talent that can be recognized as one of the top singers in the country, right? There was a book that came out and, you know, I compared Whitney Houston to the difficulty that Black Brazilian women have in making it in the world of uh, popular Brazilian music or MPB, there were a number of women in that book that talked about how some of them had to fight with record labels in order not to be just stereotyped as samba singers simply because they were Black women. Other people decided to take their talents overseas where they felt like they would get a, a more fair shake uh, getting into music outside of Brazil. So um, what I discovered in that book is that it's 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 uh it's it's like a little known thing like in Brazil's music industry where very few black artists were having piano players on their albums and it was like it was something that would separate just <clears throat> being thrown in a a category with other black samba musicians versus having a little bit more sophistication to your music so it was considered um. Uh, it, it was considered something that put you above just a typical Black artist if you had a piano player on your album. Now, that's something else that I have to talk about. This is another reason why Johnny Alf is so important, because you don't find many Black piano players of, you know, uh, people who are well known in Brazil. There's like a handful. Unlike the, the, the tradition in the Black church and, you know, jazz in the United States, where there's probably thousands of well known, well, at least hundreds of well-known piano players, right? Because of jazz and because of gospel music, it was just, it, it was easy to find a black piano player in the United States back in the fifties and sixties when Bossa Nova was coming up. But in, in all of the years that I've looked and learned as much as I could about Brazilian music, I've only come through less than a dozen black Brazilian piano players. It's another topic for a future video. Anyway, um, there were a few Afro-Brazilian artists who were able to explore music beyond the samba. But as I started visiting Brazilian used record stores, again, these places were called Cebus. And whenever I would visit Brazil, I would always make sure to visit, you know, a local record store that sold vinyl. You, I just, I would find gems in there. I started to notice that when I looked at musical categories, such as MPB, Bossa Nova Rock, or Brazilian instrumental music, the rarer it was to find black artists. On the other hand, when I looked in the, the, the bins for samba music, they were overflowing with black samba singers and groups. Now, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of samba music too, but I just wonder why is it that it seems like all of the black artists are segregated off into the samba category? Of course, as mentioned previously, 
Bossa Nova was actually based on a cool mixture between samba, jazz, and uh, classical music. But I found it strange that I didn't find any well-known Black musicians in the category. So this is a cover story from the New York Times. Uh, don't ask me the years, probably about 2010. And they're recognizing this. Uh, uh, the, the story says uh, a Black pianist helped birth Bossa Nova. His story is rarely told. Johnny Elf has always been revered by one of the top Bossa Nova composers, Antonio Carlos Jobim and João Gilberto. But his legacy remains obscure, even among Brazilians. Okay, so they have Johnny Elf, a father of Bossa Nova. This is a New York Times headline. Johnny Elf died in 2010 at the age of 80. And although his death was reported in top Brazilian newspaper, newspapers such as Folha de Sao Paulo and Estadão, and even, you know, the top United States uh, newspaper, uh, the New York Times, they all mentioned how the artist had died relatively forgotten among Brazilian music fans. But then something else caught my eye. All of these articles that paid homage to Alf credited him as being either the father of Bossa Nova, the pioneer, a precursor to the style, or one of the most important artists in the development of the genre, that would enchant the world of music and catch on around the world starting in the late 1950s. So, you know, I've already shown that this is from the New York Times. On the Brazilian end, these are some headlines and some, you know, on, you know, websites or, you know, newspapers, whatever. They're talking about, you know, Johnny Alf died. He's one of the precursors of the Bossa Nova movement. Johnny, Johnny Alf, a pioneer of Bossa Nova, died. A uh, black pianist helped to give birth to Bossa Nova. His, 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 his story is almost never told. The composer Johnny Elf died. He was a precursor of the Bossa Nova. So these, are, these are all headlines uh, on Brazilian websites, right? So years after um, he, we could say he, he set the, he, he, he blazed the trail for what would become Bossa Nova, not Bossa Nova later on. But in his day, he probably just get, he didn't get his accolades. And there's a number of reasons some people believe that Johnny Alf kind of died almost forgotten. Um, one article is not going to cover all of that. Matter of fact, I have to get I have to actually put up another piece because this is this is my own history with Brazilian music. And later I'm going to get into somebody's article who goes a little bit further into how she sees why it is that Johnny Alf is kind of unknown, particularly with his. And it's a big thing considering his importance to the birth of Bossa Nova, and we're going to get into that. But let me go on to what I'm talking about here before I introduce that article. Hold it, pump the brakes. The father of Bossa Nova. How is it that Alf was considered the father of a genre that captured the hearts of music fans around the world, but his name wasn't as well known as that of Jobim, Gilberto, Menges, uh, Bonfa and some of the other artists I previously mentioned. Well, that's where things get interesting. In the piece below, Joyce Berth shares her take on the question. In an upcoming article, I will explore this question again. Now, some of you may be familiar with a guy named Sergio Menges. He was perhaps one of the most popular Brazilian artists to get uh, recognition and gain some popularity in the United States. And, you know, I always looked at Sergio Mendes like, you know, it's another one of those one of those situations where you look at a Brazilian and be like, well, he's not actually white. You know, he's something, but clearly he's not white. Maybe even he might even be considered white in Brazil. But I always wondered, what's, you know, what is uh, Sergio Mendes' background? And I found out that one of his grandfathers was actually black. So, again, that would come into question to say, OK. Who defines what's black? You know, would Sergio Mendes be considered black? Certainly, I've never heard anybody in Brazil consider him to be black, but he is of African ancestry. I'll leave it at that. Anyway, a, a really famous picture of Johnny Alf here. Um, so let's get into this piece by Joyce Berth. It's called Bossa Nova and White Fear, How Subtle Mechanisms of Racism Ended Up Erasing Johnny Alf as the Father of the Style of One of the Most Important Musical Movements in Brazil. So on July 6, 2019, Brazil said goodbye to one of its greatest artists, uh, João Gilberto. No doubt about the immense gap in Brazilian culture, as well as about uh, João's undeniable talent as an exponent of our music. All the media reported that the father of Bossa Nova had died. 
This musical paternity he shared with the equally legendary Tom Jobim. At the time, this massive reference to the great Joao Gilberto as the father of Bossa Nova called me for a more in-depth uh, reflection on this historic moment of birth of what is still today one of the most important musical movements in the country, inside and outside of it, because Bossa Nova is one of the most heard rhythms worldwide. In dictionaries, as well as roughly speaking, in biology, a father is one who fertilizes an egg to be gestated. So far, so good. I mean, more or less. I find it very difficult that someone in this country has not heard at least once the whispered singing of Joao Gilberto, as well as the skillful mastery of Tom Jobim's fingers caressing the piano. The media landmark of Bossa Nova was the composition Chega de Saudade from 1958, written by the consecrated partnership between Tom Jobim and lyricist Vinicius G. Moraes, and recorded first by the diva Elisete Cardozo and later by Joao Gilberto, who played guitar in both versions. And there we have a problem. We actually have the problem, which is more common in Brazil than our emblematic Garota G. Ipanema, which is, you know, it's been translated and sung in English as the girl from Ipanina, would judge. Through personal research, I discovered that almost a decade before the famous recording that would give Joao Gilberto the paternity of Bossa Nova, this acclaimed and sophisticated sonority and musical format had already emerged from the piano through the skillful fingers of Mr. Alfredo José da Silva, or Johnny Alf, a brilliant pianist, composer, and performer. So this is the name that I was actually looking for. You know, he, uh, so it looks like he took the first three letters of his first name and put it into his last name. I don't know if, I don't see how you would get José, get Johnny out of José, but Okay, so we see that he shortened his lap, his first name and used that as his last name. And then he added Johnny on the front on the front of his name, you know, like Johnny being a very, you know, common American name. So I see it here as this guy trying to Americanize his sound to, you know, get possibly reach the American uh, music audience. A historical figure that is less revered than his competence and importance would demand. As we can conclude by the words of the journalist Hui Castro for the 40 G Sao Paulo newspaper in 2016, Johnny Elf without, without a doubt was a great precursor of Bossa Nova in the 1950s. It is a process that has been going on since the 1940s. At least Bossa Nova was just an innovation on top of a Brazilian Bossa that already existed. The conclusion of an evolutionary process and Johnny Elf like uh, another musician, Joao Donato, was already quite involved within this whole process. That is, he was already a bossa nova artist 10 years before bossa nova. Okay, uh, for many music critics and historians, Johnny Apple was the father and precursor of Brazilian bossa nova. So this is him again sitting at the piano with this, with his looks like a trio here with drums and bass backing him up. Born on May 19, 1929 in Rio de Janeiro, Alfredo Jose da Silva lost his father, Antonio, a military fighter of the 1932 revolution when he was just three years old, which forced his mother, Inez Manina da, da Conceição, to work as a domestic maid to support him. In the house where his mother worked, he had, a, he had the precious opportunity of having a good school education and still studying piano and classical music at the age of nine. His penchant for Black American popular music, jazz, especially for the charming songs that adorned the sound of cinema at the time led him to admire geniuses like Nat King Cole and Cole Porter. In 1949, he entered the artistic world through the hands of Jiki Farnet. And in 1952, he came to know in the musical Nights of the Rio de Janeiro, who would become one of his most illust illustrious pupils, Tom Jobim. About one year later in 1953, he would record two songs that would mark his contribution to Brazilian popular music, Sel e Mar e and Hapais Jibang, the later being considered a precursor to Bossa Nova. So one thing I wanna point out here, I said in a previous video that it, sociologists have talked about how for black Brazilians to be able to climb socially, they need to link up with some type of white godfather who can kind of introduce them and help them out, right? So in this scenario, you see where Johnny Alf's mother worked in the home of a rich man or you'll say just well-to-do man. And because of this contact with this man, 
Johnny Alf was able to, I don't know if he taught me, he might, he took you know, like piano lessons. He had access to a piano. Whereas, you know, other black kids, his age growing up in a favela or just very poor, they wouldn't have had, had access to being able to play a piano or even have lessons to be able to learn this instrument. You know, this is why, you know, you, when you go into poor communities, you know, if people, you have samba groups, <clears throat> And you'll see what the basic music lineup lineup is for a samba group. So you, it's very rare that you're going to find a piano player in samba. So uh, here's another situation where uh, you could say that this guy was possibly like Johnny Al's godfather. And, you know, he was able to help him out and, you know, put him on the road towards becoming a professional musician. All right. But where is the problem? It's in this musical paternity displaced from Johnny Alf to Joao Gilberto. More precisely, it's the reason for the displacement of this paternity, racism, but not naked and raw racism, the one that kills a George Floyd in the daylight or lets a Miguel fall from the ninth floor of a building. I speak of racism in its camouflaged, unnoticed forms, which are therefore lethal. One of the minute of racism is subtle exclusion or symbolic death. As Abadias de Nascimento wrote in Eugenicidio do Negro Brasileiro. Again, this is a book that I talked about, you know, recently, uh, the re-release of that book, uh, I think in 2017, maybe. Me, the, the title of the book means the genocide of the Black Brazilian. Uh, it's the one that ends up convincing the Black person himself that his relevance is no, or its relevance in the most important issues is limited. So um, one thing I want to point out here because I, the, the the author of this article, Joyce Berg, also also talked about besides the, the the killing of George Floyd, she's also talking about this kid named Miguel. This is a story that's ongoing in Brazil. I don't. It's been a couple of years now where uh, I think it was a, a black mother who was working. I think she wh whatever type of job she was working, she left her son with either her 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 boss. It was a, a white family who was taking care of her son. You know, I think she might have been working at the time. I have to pull that article up because I. it was a big story a couple of years ago. Um, the woman who was watching her son, she wasn't keeping an eye on him. And he ended up falling from, I think, maybe the eighth, it says here, the ninth floor of a building. Obviously, he fell to his death. So it was a huge story in Brazil. It's something I have to cover in the future. But um, I need to go back and figure out what happened with that case. But it was a hot story for a couple of years there. So anyway, continuing, another picture of Johnny Alf here. Alf was black, homosexual, of poor origin, and introspective, despite being nice. In a report on the true father of Bossa Nova made by Nilton Caraza, musician, journalist, and editor of the digital magazine Teclas y Afins, I recovered a comment by Alf justifying his little adherence to the movement and the little repercussion of his first official work, the album Hapais Gibane, released in 1961, when the Bossa Nova was already formalized and whitened. Quote, this is a quote from Johnny Alp. This may have been a result of my temperament. I've always been away from the crowd because I'm very suspicious of people. The problems I had in life created relationship difficulties. In a group, I was never secure, unquote. So uh, as I will point out in future articles, some people have speculated that Johnny Alf was discriminated against. He was excluded or not really given his fair due because he was black. Some people say because he was gay. Um, Johnny Alf here himself is, is talking about his distance from crowds. And then other people say that, well, he wasn't in Rio at the time that the Bossa Nova movement jumped off. He was, I think he was in Sao Paulo at the time. So. You know, one article, I don't think I'm going to get to the bottom of Johnny's Alf, Johnny Alf's like uh, exclusion from the history of Bossa Nova, but I want to get more into this. I just wanted to introduce his story to, you know, I, I believe his story is very important. In a report by the New York Times from August of 2020, Nelson Valenza, who was his producer for over 20 years, said, quote, there was a movement to, provoke, to promote Tom Jobim, who was rich, white, young, and handsome. Maybe he was someone who could outshine Tom Jobim, unquote. So here you have his producer, Nelson Valenza, talking, he's openly talking about like, look, Tom Jobim was considered white. So is it possible that 
the music Brazil's music industry decided to push Tom, Tom Jobim to the forefront and leaving uh, Johnny Alf to the back and, you know, in the background and not fully giving him credit for the music that would explode, you know, in that period, let's say between 55 and 65, you know, the bossa nova. So, you know, it, Joyce, Joyce Barrett wrote this article a few years ago and Obviously, there are other people who see that Johnny Alf, he got the short end of the stick. But can we say it was directly because he was black or were there other uh, other issues going on behind the scene? It's hard to say. In addition to this media promotion movement that the privileged had, there was also white fear, which manifests itself in the presence of black people who de demonstrate autonomy and independent personality. As Johnny insisted on maintaining his musical freedom, experimenting and always trying to innovate and not letting himself fall into the common sense of the record labels of the time who saw in Bossa Nova the opportunity to confront the American rock and roll that dominated the world music market. So here's another piece uh, to this puzzle of why Johnny Alf is not as well known as Tom Jobim. You know, uh, in that book that I was just talking about, um, there were black women who talked about how they fought with record labels to be able to make the type of music that they wanted to make while the record labels, seeing them as being black women, they automatically wanted to put them in the samba category. I don't know, maybe it might be possible that this is something that uh, went behind the scenes with Johnny Alf. Like he wanted his musical freedom. He wanted to be able to play the type of music he wanted to play. Like I said, it's, it's, it's still up in the air what why it is that Johnny Alf is not as well known as the other uh, creators of the Boston over at the time. But <laughs> I do want to get to the bottom of this. So here you have it where I was talking about, you know, uh, the Brazilian music industry at the time was looking for something that could compete with American rock and roll, which he had emerged by the mid 50s. So you're seeing Boston over and rock and roll come out right around the same time. It is clear that Johnny Alf had his talent recognized, and in his career, he counts more than 80 compositions recorded by big names, such as, these are Brazilian musicians, Chico Buarque and Roberto Menescal. But not as he should be, since it was the source where all white Bossa Nova musicians drank, such as Carlos Lida, Sergio Ricardo, and Vinicius de Moraes. For the one who was a master, not only of the great Tom Jobim, who nicknamed him the Genie Alf, meaning you know, a mixture of genius and his last name, Alf. But of João Gilberto himself, the part that was reserved for him in the history of MPB and especially of Bossa Nova is very small. We can safely say that if it weren't for Hapais Gibane, the song, the story of Bossa Nova might not have achieved the international respect it has achieved. Unlike the white father acclaimed by the media, João Gilberto, the death of Johnny Alf in 2010 was not so commented on, and few remembered that he was the true precursor of Bossa Nova. The plan to make this movement a landmark in the country's musical arts, whitening samba and bringing a white university student and happy Brazil to the world, distant from the reality of Rio's slums continues today. If you ask the Beyonce or Rihanna fan club about Bossa Nova, you will hear from the overwhelming majority, e coisa de branco. It's a white thing, even in the midst of the demand for representation. Intriguing what they're saying here. Um, first of all, uh, the image associated with Bossa Nova took the listener away from Rio slums that was more uh, connected with, say, Samba, definitely today and even, you know, 60 years ago, 60, uh, when you had the birth of, uh, of Bossa Nova. It's like when you look at Brazil as a whole, what image comes to mind? Do you think of poor kids running around with no shoes on, uh, kicking a soccer ball in a favela? Or do you think of middle class Rio? Do you think of the beaches where, you know, you have some prominent, you know, uh, middle class people hanging out? You know, what's the image of Brazil? So in many ways, elites have tried to distance itself from it, the, the poverty of, of a, a large percentage of its population. And so with Bossa Nova being something that's considered white and middle class, in some ways it erased the, the black roots that you find in a piano player like Johnny Alf, who one could argue without Johnny Alf's contributions to the beginnings of Bossa Nova, maybe we wouldn't have the sound. Anyway, in the Brazilian racial issue, there are gaps and invisibilities that we don't know, but that we feel. The real paternity of Bossa Nova, for example, is one of them. 
as the rap, the classic rap group Hacionized MC said in the song Da Ponchi Da, uh, da Ponchi Aki, it's a lot of mayhem for famed composer Vinicius G. Moraes. Moraes is a, you know, he's a famous poet and musician, and he's one of the songwriters of just numerous classic Brazilian songs. So again, you got people like Vinicius de Moraes, you've got Tom Jobim, Joao Gilberto, and all of these people are credited with uh, participating in this movement called Bossa Nova, but somebody like uh, Johnny Alf, a lot of people don't know who he is. So that's why I wanted to bring this story forward. There's going to be more that I want to talk about with Johnny Alf. I want to get into the question of, you know, uh, Black Brazilian piano players. There's a couple of really good uh, Afro-Brazilian piano players that touch on like making Brazilian jazz and mixing jazz with all different types of, uh, you know, Brazilian rhythms. They're making some really uh, exciting music these days. So to talk more about this, I wanted to introduce Johnny Al first for, so that we can understand how music and race also has its own story in Brazil, similar to what we, what we understand uh, when we're talking about American music, such as the blues, jazz, and rock and roll. So anyway, I'm going to end this video here. I'm quite sure I'll be revisiting the story of Johnny Alf because there's so much more to say. But just curious to know what you thought about this, uh, this story. Drop a comment in the comment section. Uh, definitely subscribe to the channel. Share this video. If, if, you, if you learn something from it, you think uh, maybe other people would appreciate this piece. And definitely uh, hit the notification bell so that you'll know when I put up a new video. And with that said, I'm going to cut the video here and hope to see you guys on my next video.